A Union Jack flops flaccidly, heralding the best of British ales, the sterile silence broken only by the rustle of a tabloid. Sun, star, male. A bedraggled buffet of a breakfast club, reserved for the dedicated morning shift. Pints are sipped while lines are reviewed, studiously ignoring the stench of pish. The old men in weather spoons are angry about the politics. Another migrant vote, another pointless vote, not anyone thought to ask them. They may as well be ghosts. Used to work every day. Trade sweat for respect, a modest check, but those days are gone, left with two dodgy knees and a crick in the neck. And this theme park pub harks back, a reconstruction of an ideal, distorted through golden arch economics, paint served with a fast food feel. But it's open early for business, and everyone keeps to themselves. The telly is tuned to Sky Sports News as the atmosphere compels. This is it. Born to shit. A plastic scrappy pop bombless wet. we exiled and reviled. Jizzed on the fake leather and unwanted stepchild. The old men in weather spoons are angry about the politics. Walked all their days just to get fuck all. Well, the paper says some immigrant prick gets a free smartphone to call home. To whatever shithole country he sailed to escape. All those years of paying taxes was surely a mistake. How can they fail to feel that all power has been lost? When control doesn't reside in callous hands, when violet slips are crossed. So the pub becomes a dominion, a jurisdiction marked out in empties, delineated by the eight bit whale of the puggy machine, devouring a wallet of Chris Twenties. The old men in weather spoons are angry about the politics. Coached in the rage from every angle, trained to be incensed at the latest scandal. What opinion is yours to disentangle? When the paper screen blew murder and the TV edits the truth, the algorithm recommends conspiracy theories while the radio phone in carries the proof. This is it. Born to shit, no trust for your feckless hypocrites. We exiled and reviled, ignored by a cabal of wanton pedophiles. The old men in weather spoons are angry about the politics. And I find it hard to blame them. An army of amateur analysts lining up to shame them. Have you ever felt forgotten? Like the world has left you behind? Thursday night means curry club. Debit. Card. Declined. Sorry for shouting pedo so early on in the show. <laughs> <laughs> the old guys at Weatherspoons, eh? Get a bad rap. But there's actually a lot that I identify with there. Because there's a pride, right? There's that tribalism. Being part of something bigger than yourself. The dignity of working hard and living hard. But there's also an unease. Because the old guys at Weatherspoons don't think they'd like me. Don't think they'd even want to try. 
Because my clothes, my voice, my general fucking existence is incongruous with working class culture. Even saying the word incongruous is incongruous <laughs> with working class culture. And it's also a disgust in the way we are so easily manipulated by the media, the way in which our solidarity has been replaced with divisiveness. I have some questions about class. Namely, at what point are you no longer allowed to be working class? And who the fuck gets to decide anyway? And uh, that's the show. You can all fuck off now. <laughs> How was that show at the Fringe? No, it was brilliant. He came out, shouted paedophile at us. <laughs> Got to the conclusion very quickly, five stars. <laughs> Class isn't chosen. It's assigned at birth. Glad we sorted that out. <laughs> now, I know this will shock you because of how clearly Together I have it as an adult, but I was a particularly weird child. <laughs> and the thing about being weird as fuck is that you don't know you're weird as fuck. Everybody else does. Parents, teachers, classmates, janitors. <laughs> but you, you're the last to know that you're different. Kids are very good at pointing out differences though. Like we trained assassins for your insecurity. If you've got a big nose, no point to anybody in particular here. If you've got a big nose, you've got a big nose, right? If you're fat, then you're fat. If you're poor, didn't know I was poor until somebody told me. And even then, they were just repeating what they'd heard at home, that my uniform had to been washed that my teeth hadn't been brushed, that there were four of us in that wee flat. And all of that's true. But there was no room there for the, the mother with a newborn suffering from postnatal depression, or the dad working in another country, or the five-year-old in the middle try harder all together. Because circumstances aren't what people see. Outcomes are. And so this hierarchy gets established before you've even been finished to learn the alphabet. In this life, there are kicking kings and there are wriggly worms. What one are you? I just started to take my first steps into society. I'd already realised that it didn't want me. Did you ever have a pal who had, like, the nice house? <laughs> and you go around after school sometimes and they'd, uh, they'd offer you juice and they meant the kind squeezed from a fruit. <laughs> I was always so amazed by how these people lived with their soda streams and their Sky TV and their ability to show affection without alcohol. I was blown away just to be in that space. Felt like I was the, the extra in a film. If the film was entitled, Why is this strange child in my house again? <laughs> well, when you go to a nice house, you realize that there's different rules. It's different cuisine, even. On the menu at my house, reconstituted meat shaped into an indecipherable animal. Chips slash the faces of haunted potato men, <laughs> tomato sauce, fizzy juice, not squeezed from a fruit, served on the couch. On the menu at my friend's house, a chicken casserole with a side salad, water, and a jug. An overwhelming sense of judgment disguised as concern served at the table with a convivial atmosphere. And their parents would be like these movie stars, these smiling creatures, they'd be 
well-dressed, intelligent, interesting, interested, house-proud, liberal, relaxed, and with a large group of friends that they enjoyed regularly holidaying with in Spain. Of course, as an adult, I now understand that these people were clearly swingers. <laughs> But at the time, I was just impressed. Of course, I get it. The existential angst of the lower middle classes. How the expectations that are bred into them from birth have to be carried around their adulthood like a Sisyphean ball of disappointment. But they did get to go to centre parks. <laughs> so fuck them. When you're a poor kid, you have this decision that you need to make. Are you going to be loud? Or are you going to be quiet? Are you going to be seen or unseen? You can be big and loud and fierce, walled off predators by being unpredictable and boisterous. The mad bastard defence. <laughs> or... You can be quiet, attempt to blend in with your surroundings, attempt to confuse the predators by becoming invisible, which is what I did. I always felt there was something pretty brave about the ones who decided to be loud, the ones that stood up and they said, aye, this is me, this is who I am, what the fuck are you going to do about it? Something quite honourable about that. That wasn't for me though. My job was to disappear. It's hard to disagree. It's hard to disappear at your granny's house, so, isn't it? <laughs> Especially with the holographic picture of Jesus watching you from the hallway. <laughs> A picture in which he would slowly morph into his own mother as you walked past it. <laughs> There'd be an exact point where if you caught it just right, the images would align. Jesus and Mary like a Catholic two-face. <laughs> but my grand sis, that's, that's where we went every Sunday, right? It's where we went to spend time with my family, where I went to spend time with my cousins. Now my cousins, they were what was known at the time as streetwise. Streetwise. That was the ability to handle yourself in a rough, urban environment, okay, streetwise. I was not streetwise. I had never been by the top of the road. <laughs> but being streetwise, it seemed to me to consist of a confidence. A confidence usually boosted by wearing the best gear. I don't know what it's like nowadays, but see in the 90s, See, wearing the best of gear, the latest brands, it was basically a referendum on whether your parents loved you or not. <laughs> and my mum had unfortunately not received the best of gear memo. So she kitted me out with a pair of trainers that she'd seen an advert for on the telly. An advert in which all the children looked very happy. So she didn't get me a pair of Adidas, or a pair of Puma, or a pair of Fila, or even a pair of fucking Diodora. No. <laughs> My ma saw fit to bestow me with a pair of Nyx trainers. <laughs> Nyx trainers, the, the worst trainers of the 90s, and the Nyx trainers, the most unfashionable footwear you could possibly own, Nyx trainers. Google it if you need to. Next trainers. <laughs> Not right now, next trainers. Like Nike with a learning difficulty, next trainers. Of course, my cousins love this. Where did you get them for? <laughs> How much did they cost? Are you the cunt for the advert? <laughs> And like all these moments, 
had to be commemorated in song. You knit your necks from the neck shop, was my own personal day. You knit your necks for the neck shop, which is insulting on a number of levels. Not only was I wearing uncool trainers, but I had acquired them through theft. <laughs> Not only was I kicking about stealing unfashionable footwear, but I was going straight to the source, the next shop. <laughs> what was I expecting to find there? <laughs> but I was saved by a, a new invention, a chance for me to finally own the best of gear, a chance for me to, to armour myself against the trials of the playground. I am, of course, talking about the catalogue. <laughs> Kay's catalogue, which gave working class people the chance to own the latest brands at hugely inflated rates. <laughs> it was a sort of Argos catalogue of despair. <laughs> Here was a whole lifestyle contained in these pages, and you could have it, but you'd be paying it off for the next five years, <laughs> long after those tracksuits no longer fitted. Didn't it bother me, though? This was a chance for me to own a wee bit of cultural camouflage. So I, I get this. Oh yes. <laughs> a Haley Hansen jacket. Oh yeah. Now like all kids fashion trends. I don't know why we all decided on mass to dress like a Norwegian fisherman <laughs> at a fetish night. But we did, and I didn't want to be left out. So instead of PlayStation games or books for my Christmas, I got this, a suit of armor that says, I'm not actually poor, so please don't bully me. And the depressing thing is, it worked. Opinions changed on me overnight. I had successfully faked it for the first time. Of course, I still knew I was different, right? I could feel it in my bones. But was I already deliberately cultivating that difference? Attempting to be different because it made me feel special? We're having a laugh about my granny's house there, but actually, I'd get so anxious before I went there. And my mum, bless her, she knew that. She knew me. So I was allowed to get a comic book to read. And I would, cover to cover. Sonic the comic was my favourite, by the way. An <laughs> underrated classic. And her family, they would gear shit for this. They'd say, what is he doing in here reading when he should be out there playing? And my mum would take that flack and she'd say, just leave me alone. It's not doing anyone any harm. And I don't think I realised how important that was. The fact that she was taking that criticism and deflecting it away from me to allow me the space to be who I was. One Sunday, at my grand's house. My aunt told me that I was going home to Spam Valley. And I didn't know what that meant. My mum told me later that this was an insult. The Spam Valley is when poor people moved to a posh estate, but they couldn't afford to pay for it. So they had to eat Spam for their dinner instead. No, I really didn't understand. I was a poor kid in class. We lived in this wee flat. How the fuck was I for this spam valley? But in the eyes of her family, my mum's move away from one of the most notorious schemes in North Glasgow. 
Menschen dentro da new milieu. That a one bedroom bar at home was an abandonment of where she came from. That she clearly thought she was better. That she was destined for greater things. And now, she had this weird as fuck son. Who pretty much proved all of that. A born resident of Spam Valley. Now, if you're going to reinvent yourself, there can't be any better place to go than university. <laughs> no one there knows that you were the poor kid in class. No one knows you had a dinner ticket. No one knows that you aren't cool. Because suddenly, suddenly you can be with the right Clothes, the right books, the right opinion deftly dropped. You can be. And the best bit is, there's no one from home to give it away. Universities like create a character mode in a computer game. <laughs> now faced with the choice of being whoever I wanted, I decided to be fucking unbearable. <laughs> The intellectual film lover insisting that if anything, Citizen Kane is actually underrated. <laughs> the sensitive music fan poring over the nuances of the latest Radiohead release. <laughs> the beer swelling lager lout just checking in about your birth control situation the next day <laughs> by text <laughs> with my. Jack Daniels poster on the wall, Battle Royale on the telly, Smiths on the stereo. I was a complete and utter, absolute, grade A cunt. <laughs> but no longer a poor cunt. So I started leveraging my voice as a working class person in the room, attempting to sound rough when I'd spent my whole life up to this point trying to do the opposite. I was faking it again. This time with a new uniform. Because I didn't go to university to sup from the cup of knowledge, to expand my cultural understanding, or even to increase my employability, no. I went there pretty much exclusively for the girls. <laughs> and these were middle class girls. Girls from good homes, girls from nice families. Girls who had that chicken casserole with a side salad on the menu. Girls whose dad still called them princess unironically. <laughs> and here I was, taken into their world like a refugee. A wee bit of rough to shock their parents. Little did they know, I was about as rough as freshly blended Thomas. <laughs> <laughs> and just as hard. I always knew this other world existed. The two cars in the driveway. The dad watching Top Gear. The mum cooking out of spite in a kitchen bigger than my house. And here I was in the inside. And it felt like maybe I was supposed to be here. I'd left home and reinvented myself for better things. And maybe, maybe this is what those better things looked like. It looked like comfort. It looked like wealth. It looked like the slow gentrification of the soul. Hey, baby. <laughs> I want to come.
cover you in pesto. <laughs> I want to bend you over the breakfast bar and hey presto. I want to take you away on a romantic city break. Take that balsamic vinegar and shake, shake, shake. I want to take you out to the GFT. You can read the subtitles with my hand on your knee. Let's lay together. Read in the Guardian in bed. Then go to the garden centre and make love in the sheds. I'll take you for a drive in my old Ford estate with the two litre engine and the E red you play. <laughs> Crowned with a bike rack, rusted with neglect under which your traffic will merge and intersect its a uh, middle-class love for me and for you. It should be tax deductible <laughs> for the things we do. <laughs> Oof. Almost left after you graduate. Those people who are bred for power, well, they might have positions lined up for them, jobs and family companies, maybe just an endless stream of money to allow them the time to decide what they'd like to do with their lives. For the rest of us, there are very few options. You are a graduate. You have an arts degree. You did not know it at the time, but you have been training your entire life to work in a call center. <laughs> and the call center is full of broken dreams. It's like a little microcosm of capitalism with a pool table and a 10% discount We'll keep the masses sedate while well, their time is milked for all it's worth. And it's all underpinned by this inescapable economic certainty. You have to keep feeding the machine or the machine will crush you. Also, the machine is monitoring how long you take to do a shite. <laughs> which for me is the very peak of capitalism, <laughs> when bodily functions stand in the way of profit. <laughs> and it's hard to dispute it when you're confronted with the evidence. How many times? Six, 17, 17 times? Yes, I really did take that many piss breaks. That's because consuming water has become my only pleasure. <laughs> and I'd much rather experience the small joy of holding my own penis for a few seconds while I urinate than work another minute in this soulless corporation. Small joy, also coincidentally the nickname for my penis. <laughs> Come on, that's the best joke in the show. <laughs> At one point, I found myself working in a call centre doing outbound calls for the RSPCA. Okay. You used to have to phone people up and you had this really strict script that you needed to follow. Word for word, no deviation, right? So you'd phone people up and you'd say, uh, hello, is this Mrs Harris? Yes, speaking. And without any kind of introduction, without any kind of leading, the first thing you had to say was, do you know that right now dogs are being abused in your area? <laughs> do you know that right now dogs are being abused in your area? Do you know that right now dogs are being abused in your area? It initially sounds like it might be a threat. <laughs> and then latterly, an invitation. <laughs> Do you know that right now dogs are being abused in your area? 
Do you know that right now, dogs are being abused in your area? <laughs> what are you up to on Friday? <laughs> Did you see the thing? I saw the... Yeah, it came up on my, my Twitter. Um, yeah, I'm going to go. I've got tickets, so... It'd be great if, if you could come along. I'd love... Yeah. Like, no pressure, just like, but if you're up for it, it'd be great to, to share it with you. Yeah. We don't need to call it a date, but, like, yeah. I think it'd be pretty amazing. And Yeah, look, honestly, I, I'm going anyway. You know I'm there. Every time, front row, any time the dog abuse is in town, you know I'm there. <laughs> But I just think that it'd be kind of beautiful to share it with you. So shall I pick you up about eight? Okay, cool. Where is it? It's um, in your area. <laughs> Sometimes life provides a way out. And you just need to be open to seeing it. Especially when it comes in an unfamiliar form. I'd hoped my whole life that art would save me. And it hasn't yet. <laughs> but it did give me a new way of being. But of all the things that I thought would spare me from a life of asking old ladies about animal abuse, <laughs> poetry was pretty far down the list. When the revolution comes. When my fingernails are teased from their beds. When the simulated drowning chokes my soul. When the lamp shone in my face is my only source of light. I will still be unable to recall. I will still lack the exact knowledge of the precise moment that I became. Was in that first craft beer that did it? And the subsequent realisation that alcohol could be brewed for taste and not volume. <laughs> Mr Mad Dog never made us aware of this. <laughs> Was it on the successful completion of my first downward facing dog? Limbs as nimble as my social mobility. Morals as flexible as my hips. No class war in Warrior 2. <laughs> Namaste, social conscience. <laughs> Was it when my voice became attuned to its own wavelength? No longer hiding the weight of vocabulary behind it. The passion in my timbre or the truth that lies in my gut. I was that first taste of hummus that done it. <laughs> Soft and exotic in my tongue. Or the purchase of a tweed jacket, a coarse social signifier. I can't say for certain. Because I never made this decision. This was a judgment handed down, a classification ordained by my betters, who looked at the evidence and decreed that this, this is a middle class man. My betters who judged blithely, but could not see behind the facade of my stage persona to the tempestuous history that shaped me and how could they my post-ironic disposition could not convey. 
the 17 years preceding liberation, quarantined in a bad at prison prefab cell. My New Balance trainers could not intimate a silo of memories. My father collapsed in the street, belly full of whiskey, lungs heavy with asbestos. My world cinema DVD collection could not explain the sorrow that inhabited my core and refused to leave as I held the hand of my mother's limp body. But all of that, all of that is immaterial. Because doesn't my dress sense just scream? <sighs> Academic. <laughs> so when did it happen? This transformation from working class misfit to petty bourgeoisie wannabe. Was it with those beautiful girls? The ones I chased around university campuses and state house parties. Is class sexually transmitted? <laughs> no. Surely it occurred in my ability to successfully negotiate the superior jargon of a creative Scotland funding form. <laughs> By far my greatest achievement. <laughs> So I stand in front of you today, a working class traitor, or a middle class failure, or most likely both, to ask that your labels could perhaps be a little more accurate, or at least a little less adhesive. It leaves a mark on my tweed jacket, you see. Poetry was taking over my life. Open mics, showcases, slams, didn't matter to me. I was there, front row, it was lighting up my brain and I was like an addict looking for my next fix. And suddenly, suddenly people started booking me, started paying me money, and most likely beer in exchange for my words. But the thing about poetry is, it's weird. <laughs> so weird. And it's bad. So bad. So, so bad. Unless it's not. Unless it's amazing and life-changing and soul-enriching. Unless it opens up a little window into your mind and allows you to experience a level of empathy that you thought otherwise impossible. Then it's all right. <laughs> but the big thing about poetry is, for the most part, it's played out in middle class spaces by middle class people. The bearded Latin speakers with epics about the majesty of war. <laughs> Menopausal women with odes to their crystals. <laughs> the rich kids reading poems about taking care of their smartphone. <laughs> off their smartphone. <laughs> and all these people seem to just slot in. Like this space was just waiting for them to fill. Like, of course it was. Didn't feel like that for me. It felt hard. It felt like it was a struggle to, to feel a sense of belonging there. It felt like at any moment, someone was going to tap me on the shoulder and ask me to leave. I always thought that the arts were going to be this meritocratic space. That the best art became the best known art, that the cream rose to the top. But when I got into the arts, what I realized was actually, it's just dominated by the middle classes. 
you know that only 12.4% of people working in the arts are from a low-income background? 12.4%? Why do you think that is? Got some theories. Some people get a head start in life. It could be one thing, it could be numerous things. Maybe they had a, a role model growing up, someone in the industry to look up to. Maybe they get sent to the best schools, the best universities. Maybe they could afford to survive those lean years. Maybe they could afford to fund their own art when no one else would. What I'm saying is that for some people, becoming an artist is a matter of logistics. For the rest of us, it's a matter of perseverance. Perseverance and adherence to all those unwritten, unspoken rules. Remember I was doing a gig a few years back in um, Preston. Great, brutalist bus station in Preston, by the way, if you ever get a chance to, to visit. And I was introducing a poem and I said, this is a poem about a trip that I took to Ghana, right? And everybody just fucking looked at me with these blank faces. I thought, that's weird. Like English people have a really bad grasp of geography, despite having colonized half the world. <laughs> and then somebody kind of clicked and they got it and they said, oh, you mean Ghana? You mean Ghana? I said, that's what I said, mate, Ghana. And they all started laughing. I was the one on the stage with the microphone and they were laughing at me. And they laughed and laughed and laughed. More than you should do, I think, if you're from Preston. <laughs> because I, I hadn't followed those unwritten rules. I hadn't attuned my voice to suit them. Have you heard this term before, code switching? Yeah. So that's the art of tailoring your voice to suit a specific audience. So the A, they can understand you, fair enough. But also B, to make them feel comfortable, to make sure that they don't perceive you as a threat. Pretty much what I've been trying to do for the duration of this show so far. <laughs> But this voice of mine, it's also what they call a USP, a unique selling point. It's how do you stand out in a crowded industry? By being different, right? And this voice made me stand out. But I'm starting to worry. Was I putting my voice in a wee box? Was I packaging it up with a ribbon? Was I commodifying it in order to sell it to a middle class audience. And I've started to feel the pressure. I've so often been the only working class voice in the room. Because maybe, maybe I wasn't the working class enough. Maybe I wasn't the right kind of working class. Because we struggled for money and we lived in a wee flat. That's true. But that's also not rare. Plus, I was lucky, right? Because I always had a roof over my head and shoes, or at least next trainers, <laughs> on my feet. Plus, come on, I'd never been a drug addict. I'd never been in a gang. Unless you count my RSPB membership as a child. <laughs> Do you know that right now, birds are being abused in your... <laughs> They're not, it's fine. Plus, I was from Spam Valley, right? What the fuck did I have to contribute? Was I here because I was talented? Or had I just been doing what I'd been doing my entire life? Just blending in with the environment, keeping quiet. And now suddenly, I found myself in a space where I was selling a working classness that I didn't own to a middle class audience who wouldn't know the difference if it hit them over the head with a summons from Scott and Co. <laughs> That's a niche reference. <laughs> but it didn't matter. 
because for the first time in my life, I was talking and people, people were listening. So in uh, 2020, some big stuff happened. For you as well, I. <laughs> My life fell apart. You as well, I. <laughs> All my gigs get cancelled because the venues and the theatres shut down. My career disappeared overnight. My marriage crumbled. My mental health imploded. At one point, I found myself in the flat that I used to share with my ex after she'd taken the furniture, eating my dinner from my one plate off an upturned plastic box that I was using as a table on the floor. I believe it's what's commonly referred to as rock bottom. <laughs> Wasn't it supposed to be like this? My career was kicking off, the shows were doing well, and I was living in the trendy part of Glasgow's East End with the coffee shops and the gastropubs and the aspirational living. All of that, gone in an instant. And suddenly, I was scrabbling around just to try to find somewhere to live, just to keep a roof over my head, applying to housing associations, going to see every flat that I could. And then suddenly, finally, I managed to get my own place. But options are limited for the self-employed poets of the world. <laughs> so I found myself in Springburn, North Glasgow, not too far away from where I grew up, in an area that's notorious for its drug addiction issues, its tumbling life expectancy, its massive health problems. And it felt a wee bit like I'd gone full circle, that I'd been dragged back by this gravity, away from the coffee shops and the gastropubs and the aspirational living, back, back to the poverty of my childhood. I return. A homecoming. And I'd look out the window of my new flat and I'd see the addicts huddling at the chemist's door and I'd watch the school kids running riot. I'd see the gangs fighting in the street and watch as the dealers drove by in their brand new BMWs. But I was here on the other side of the glass safe with my wine rack and my art prints and my fucking mid-century furniture. <laughs> Here and there at the same time. But there's no amount of house plants or drink cabinets that can save me from who and what I am. I am a working class person living in North Glasgow. I am at risk just for existing. My life expectancy is cut just for daring to be. We have too much around here, an excess in these parts, more than our fair share, and enough to spare. Mortality. It seeps from our taps, a slow dancing poison. Climbs perilous out the window of the high flats. Dives for fag doubts outside the shopping centre. A surplus of this mortality. This city breathes it in. A profusion of cessation. Particles plunged into the air from ancient factory pipes laden with asbestos, an industrial nightmare oblivious to the winds of change. Down the road, they have just enough. But here, we are inundated. This Glasgow effect, 
that turns beloved sons to drug addicts statistics, that strips a diet down to tins and boxes, a glut of mortality. Your ma would always claim she didn't have a favourite. But it was definitely you. We could tell she put you in the ground. Poor dear green place is fertilised with the bodies of the forgotten. Your membership to that Tuesday morning methadone crew, your nerves jangling. Till one day, they didn't. And no one can tell us why. Why we keep dying. Why there's a funeral parlour in every scheme. Why our wake outfits hang heavy with expectation on the back of bedroom doors. So we learn to wallow in the waiting. Biding time till our turn. Scanning the evening times of victories, memorialising colleagues and classmates. Faces revealing themselves from foggy memory like a brass rubbing. Right enough, the big man wasn't looking too good. Last I saw him, they don't seem to have an answer as to why it resides here. Our Asbo neighbour, aggressively lurking at the closed door. Funny how this excess sits neatly in a postcode like a stray. And for the life of you, for the life of us, no one can say why. And what should I say to the teenage mothers pushing firstborns and second-hand prams? Babies fed on mould and spores, expectancy stunted, a lifetime interrupted by this exorbitant mortality. And I wait every day for this invisible force to add me to the graph, an outlier. Mark in the trend beside family and friends, our little crosses recorded on a whiteboard, a sociologist's nightmare. I dispute the details of my mother's death certificate that did not record poverty, a lifetime of it, as cause. Around here, they call it excess mortality. They call it inevitable. They call it life. If they had the courage, they would call it what it is. They would call it genocide. But halfway through making this show, somebody asked me an interesting question. Why did I want to make this show? Why did I want to ask these questions? Why did I want to dredge up all this trauma? I'm still not 100% sure. But I think it's got something to do with that wee boy reading the comics in the corner and my mum, and what I see when I look out the window, and the shame I feel when I see my reflection in it. And all of this, brings me to here, this moment, this show, tonight. Here I am with the ability to define who I am. And what have I got to say for myself? Fuck all. <laughs> Made a career out of this, saying words out loud. But when I reached that rarefied air, of being a full-time artist, I very quickly realised that there were very few people from backgrounds like mine. And the ones that had made it were we 
we were made to compete against each other, to tick that coveted working class box. And the best way to tick the box was to be authentic. But this authenticity, it needs to be gritty. This authenticity, it needs to be mistreated. This authenticity needs to be born in a council flat. This authenticity must reside far, far away from Spam Valley. And it took me back to my childhood, to being the quiet kid. Because this authenticity that everyone was so desperate for, it seemed to me a lot like being loud. And who are we to be loud for? Those above us, right? Those people with the power, the gatekeepers. The people with the power to decide if you are worthy of space, worthy of praise, worthy of visibility. And those cunts are all middle class. <laughs> and in the eyes of a middle class gatekeeper, Working class authenticity so often equals trauma. I know I need to start taking up space without apology. I know I need to start being loud. I need to unlearn the lessons of my childhood. The ones that told me to, to blend in, to keep my head down, to stay quiet. Art can't stay quiet. Art needs to speak. So do I. When you came in here tonight, every single one of you made a judgment. You all made a decision. You decided if I was authentically working class or if I was just an actor playing the part. You decided if what I was about to say was worthy of being heard. You all decided if I was worthy of belonging. Do I belong now? There are things in this life the only the poor see. Whole constellations of existence that can only be viewed from the cheap seats. We are not a monolith. There is not a one size fits all working class experience. We do not all act the same, like the same music, wear the same clothes. Our class is who we are. Our class is where we've been. Not just some outward performance to impress those above us. And we need, we need to stop policing each other. Stop deciding who is authentic and who is inauthentic. Who has suffered enough to belong and who hasn't. Who does and who doesn't reside in Spam Valley. I am working class. Proudly, I'm also an artist, I'm also an individual, and I have one story, mine, and an interlinking galaxy of lives well lived, of hard-working men and women who excelled and overcame. These lives that are chiseled from the stone of poverty but never celebrated. I only know my story and how much it hurt me to feel like I'd forfeited my place and my culture for daring to grow when that should be the right of every one of us. I should be allowed to be sensitive. I should be allowed to be soft. I should be allowed to be thoughtful. 
I should be allowed to be authentically me without sacrificing the entire history of my lived experience. So here I am, still reporting live from Spam Valley. I've seen how they all half live. I've infiltrated their space and I've came back home. Whether you wanted me or not. Because this, this is mine. I felt it permeate me from the moment I was born. That wee boy in the one bedroom flat didn't have a chance. He was not destined for anything. He was made for silence. Yet here I am, opening my big fucking mouth with these words, with this accent. This is mine. When I'm on my deathbed, might not hold me up as an example. I might not be that archetypal working class hero. They may not know my name, but they will sure as fuck hear my words. This is mine. Like my mum before me, who was derided for thinking that she was better, that she could be, that she should be, who taught me that there's more to this life than reciting someone else's script. So here I am, writing my own. The living proof.